Hello, hello. Hi. I have my iced tea tonight and they're on these coasters that I got from Illumicrate sent me. And look at how beautiful they are. I mean, there's iced tea on that one, which makes it slightly less beautiful. Hello. So you've got Alucard and Rye, and Natalie's already here. Look at this, on top of everything. So productive. So on top of it. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. You are sideways. Oh no, I was afraid that was gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can, we can be like this. I have like, <laughs> how are you? I do not you? have a great stand for this thing so it's always a like oh I don't know I literally have mine on a piece of paper that's been folded at a weird angle it used to be on like a loose <laughs> tea bag which weirdly helps a lot <laughs> like tea bags work I don't know why I don't know why how are you I am I'm good you know all things considered yeah. how about you all things considered all things considered I am well I finally had to come to terms this past week with the fact like I'm not going anywhere for the rest of 2020 and I'm living at my parents' house. So just yeah. making peace with the strangeness of this year, if you will. Yeah. Doing my best, doing my best because I'm in one place for the rest of this year. I bought myself a toy. I bought myself this keyboard that looks and feels like a type of okay. And so it like clicky clacks. Do you um, love it? Have you tried it out yet? Oh, because I love it. I've written like 10,000 words with it. But I, I did this because when I came to France, I had one carry-on suitcase and that was all. So like eight articles of clothing, none of my like gadgets and gizmos and things that make me happy, which has made this whole stay where I've been for five months feel very temporary. So this is my way of being like, I'm going to be here for the rest of the year. So I get to have a permanent thing. That's nice. Nice way to treat yourself. It was like it was like the end of an emotional roller coaster where I was like <laughs> sobbing and was like, I don't know if everything is awful. And then I was like, I'm gonna buy myself a nice thing. People buy themselves clothes or flowers. I buy myself keyboards, apparently. I mean it makes sense to me. It does. How are you though? Aside so you're good. You're you're hunkered down? We are hunkered down. I mean we're lucky in that um, our day-to-day -day lives didn't change an awful lot because... Yeah. Because authors. You know, because authors. Um, but yeah, we sort of hit that point where everything starts to feel like, ooh, and, I, yeah. and I'm sort of at the, on the point of, I look in my backyard and I'm like, if I go out there with a shovel <laughs> and, um, you, know, you know, a shovel and like a, a measuring tape, Surely yeah. I can figure out how to install my own in-ground pool. I can do this by myself. Right? You can do this, right? Like you just, you can't sit still is your, is your thing, right? This is my problem is I start thinking like, what kind of things can I build? And, and keep in mind, I have zero experience building anything. <laughs> so this is pure stir, like, yeah. Yeah. All of oh, my I've never sat still since public, since I started publishing, I have not sat still as long as I have sat still so far this year. Like I average usually like yes. two months of the year sitting still. And this year it's gonna be a long time. And I mean, it's weird, I don't know about you. I'm moving at like a quarter speed of my productivity but I have more than four times more time for productivity. I, yeah, that, that rings true. I, I think quarter speed is probably accurate because yeah. I feel like I can't sink into anything because exactly. you, know, you never know what's gonna <laughs> next so exactly I just keep bouncing 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 and and in a good way I've had a number of different projects that allow me to do that I was gonna say we have so much to talk about because you have so much going on and so much just like manifesting but I do feel like I think I've had a very hard time sinking into long periods of focus like I had to I had to like quit Twitter because I realized I did not actually have the emotional and psychological bandwidth to like I would spend all my energy there and energy is such a precious resource right now that I was like oh this is actually preventing me from sinking my teeth into anything yeah there was and definitely skimming. some re-evaluation of where I spend um my different kinds of energy and, yeah. and I'm gonna put all of that effort so 
I mean, it's I haven't so been on Twitter for quite a long time, but I did have to reevaluate my relationship with Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. And I online, love Instagram. I, I think I love that Instagram, I mean, obviously we're on Instagram right now. I love that Instagram has a little bit more boundaries and there's a little bit less performative acting up on it. Like yeah. there's a sense of a lot of times I think on Twitter, the antagonism comes from a performative place where they want to get a rise or people want to take your energy or feel entitled to it. Whereas on Instagram, because of the model, it's, it's enforced a little bit more boundaries where people have to either message you privately or like be on your wall or do something which calls attention to them. So yes, it's definitely a different kind of performativity. I think oh, absolutely, no, absolutely. Twitter, so. I'm very self aware of the fact that like, I don't take pictures of myself. And so then I'm like, well, shit, do I need to take a picture to like, to like do a promotional thing? And I'm like, huh, the algorithm is hard. The algorithm, the algorithm is, hard. is hard. I know you and I have spent a lot of time talking about self-image and pictures and like it's how hard. do you yeah how do you keep working and, and engaging when yeah. so much of it relies on that that like presenting yourself well especially on a platform like instagram which i do feel like algorithmically prefers people pictures to like object photography and i yeah. just see a better ratio hey we're getting into like statistics but yeah. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about it was I was killing time for a few minutes, giving time for people to come, but I want to, we have so much to cover and I kind of want to just dive into it with you if you're good with that. Sure, I'm going to cheer you with this because oh. this made me this giant um, Manhattan. Oh my God. I love it. I love it. I have not, I have been told that I have to like for a little while stop drinking caffeine or alcohol which is proving to be the worst thing to ever happen to me i and so this is um uncaffeinated iced tea which is the oh, saddest man. no right way beverage choice so far i apologize oh, no i don't know i mean caffeine is so deeply important to oh my morning i mean that's basically how we got here though is like apparently i was consuming so much caffeine and chocolate and my body was like, oh, hi, no. And I was like, but I was eating like half a bar of dark chocolate and like probably five to six cups of tea a day. And my body was like, oh, we, can't, we can't do that anymore. That's not yeah, a sustainable I feel like, uh, way to go. I feel like I'm on your body's side. Maybe it's time to cut back a little. <laughs> I know it just really, chocolate is the only thing getting me through this apocalypse. But well, that's true. now that you have your giant Manhattan, I want to dive in. And so I always okay. like to start, I'm sure we will wander down our own paths, but I always really like to start with the origin story. And so if you could indulge me by just walking us through your origin story, how did you get from, you know, child Natalie living in, was it Japan? To uh, I did. <laughs> yeah, or, or all around to here, amazing author. Oh, gosh. Okay, um, I will try to be brief. Um, I, I, I think I was always writing and telling stories when I was mm -hmm. a kid, I think like many of us. Um, and I particularly enjoyed like scary stories. Um, I wrote my very first novel in high school and it was so embarrassingly autobiographical in yeah. nature. It was like um, this a story told in two points of view. One was the story of Persephone and her descent into the underworld. Um, and it was paralleled with the story of a modern day girl who mm -hmm. was going through a, um, a, a very extreme and dark experience with anorexia. Yeah. And um, that was sort of how I was understanding my own experience with anorexia and body images or body issues. Um, and I had gone through, I mean, I, I, my experience with it was pretty um, yeah. extreme. And when I was coming out of it, I used um, mythology was one of the methods that helped me sort of analyze what had happened to myself and what I was going through still. So that was my first novel and I sent it out to agents yes. and um, bless the agents who wrote back kindly to say, this is really lovely, but no. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, I thought the world was, that was it. That was the end of the world, the end of my entire career. I was never going to write again. I was never going to be published. Um, How old were you? Like, <laughs> oh gosh, I was, uh, at this point, I was a senior in high school. Okay, so, so like 17, like, 18. Yeah, yeah. And I was having the end of all of my dreams. 
Um, and I went to like this psychic in Forks, and this was well before Twilight was published. So <laughs> the, <laughs> this psychic in Forks, um, she laid down all these tarot cards. It was the coolest tarot card reading I've ever had. And she basically was like, um, telling me all about my life. And she said nothing about writing. And I was like, what about my books and my, my career as an author? And she paused and she looked back at the cards and she said, well, it's going to be a while. And oh, I was no. like, what do you know? <laughs> and at 18, you want to be told like a while is like a month. You don't want to be told it's going to be a long time. I know she was like it's gonna be years and I was like you're a terrible psychic <laughs> um anyway I wish I could remember her name because it was years like I went through college I went through grad school I studied gender studies I did all of these all of this really cool research um and it wasn't until after grad school when I was um like starting my own career in academia that I decided I wanted to return to novel writing. And I learned an awful lot about literature yeah. and what I like since, um, by then. And so, um, gosh, I wrote a book and it was not good. And so I wrote another book <laughs> as, as tends to be the process. Right. And this was the point at which I think I actually met you yeah. Um, because it was before I had ever even sought an agent and um, you were so kind to me and so encouraging. Oh, I'm glad. To, I'm glad <laughs> I wasn't just an asshole. I try hard, but you never know. <laughs> um, you were definitely not an asshole. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like, I went to this retreat with mm -hmm. you and I don't know, 25 other Oh my people. God. Was that Branson? That was Branson. Good Lord. Okay. Right? Yeah, that gives me a time. That was 2010. 10 sounds 11. Right. 2010, 2011. Yeah. And so I was there with you guys and you all took me very seriously. And I was like, wow, maybe I should take myself a little bit more seriously. And mm -hmm. I think it was within a few months, I was querying that novel that I've been working on there, which um, is the novel that turned into my debut. It's called Beware the Wild. And so it good. is swamp gothic magic. <laughs> Uh, it's so wonderful. I knew from go that your atmosphere and your voice was just something so special. Uh, same. I mean, I feel like um, the Where the Wild and the Near Witch were such like kissing cousins mm -hmm. in a weird way. Um, they both had that really beautiful like gothic atmosphere and um, mystery going on throughout. Anyway, so that was the book. I, I'm sorry, I have a hair in my face. And I no, you're fine. I understand. I understand the neuroses. <laughs> It's on my lips. <laughs> okay, okay, wait, no, I'm sorry. I got it, all right. <laughs> We're good, and now that moment will be memorialized Immortalized, <laughs> immortalized. I love it, that's the rule of the internet here. Oh gosh, so um, that was the book. I queried, and I queried, I think, eight agents, or six agents, yeah. and four of them offered representation. It was one of those, like, really quick sort of, um, trajectories at least initially and then uh it wasn't like immediate after that I think I worked on that book for nine months with my agent before we we sent it out and um the editor who ended up buying it read it overnight and like offered within like 36 hours so it was this weird um jump into publishing where some things happened very quickly and other things really didn't yeah um and that was my debut in 2014 and so here we are. In here we are. Six years yeah. later. And six years later, and you're about to close a trilogy, which is its own extreme neuroses. And I, we have to talk about it because I know you had the duology, but there's yeah. just something about a trilogy that is just its own adventure. What was it like for you? Because um, the, the final book in the trilogy comes out in November, right? Yes. Uh, you know... <sighs> I, I go back and forth now that I'm done and, mm -hmm. and half of my thoughts are like, I will never write a trilogy again. <laughs> the other half are like, I cannot wait to write another trilogy and do it better. Like do all the things that I learned this time yeah. around and do it better. Um, and this trilogy was, you know, it happened so fast. Um, and I am so deeply proud of it. I don't mean when I say I can't wait to do it. No, of course like not. Every single book I end and I'm like, I can't wait to do the next one better. 
But that's how you know you're doing it right because it's like the weird paradox that like, for instance, your first book should be your worst book, but you don't want it to be a bad book. You just want to keep leveling up each time. And there's such a trial by fire of like the only way you get better at writing trilogies is to write a trilogy and then say, and here's what I've learned. And now I get to apply it next time. Exactly. It's, it is the like killer paradox of being yeah. any kind of creative person, I think. But I always, when I was publishing Beware the Wild and I was going through that initial revision process and like race up to publication, the thing I kept repeating to myself was, mm -hmm. was like, every time you go in for a revision, you can recognize that you are already a different writer. Oh yeah. So there's always that tug, that tug between knowing that if you wanted to start from scratch, you could probably do the whole mm -hmm. thing better, but also you're in this process. So knowing when the right choice is to start over is, is hard initially. <laughs> I <Well>, think. <laughs> yeah, it's hard because, and I talk about this a lot, that like a book when it's finished becomes a static property but mm -hmm. the author continues to grow. And so like, even by the time you finished writing it though, you're already a different version of yourself. And so it's why I can never answer, yeah. like people always ask, would you ever go back and like revise anything that you wrote when you were younger? And I'm like, no, because I wrote that when I was that iteration of me, when I was right. that person and like- It's like a living history of exactly, yourself in exactly. a way. Yeah, and I always, I, I, the thing I kept repeating to myself was just, work is do this as well as you can right now so that mm -hmm. when you look back you never regret so exactly. I never want to regret the choices that I made did I choose not to, to something as heavily as I thought maybe I could um in the interest of time or whatever other yeah. pressures we experience in publishing I always wanted to know that I made good choices and I I created a good a good story and so I'm still like that's still the thing that I carry forward um, and yeah. I, I love Beware the Wild, um, even though there are parts of it where I look back and I'm like, oh, I get it. Now. <laughs> I get what I was trying to do, and I know that I can do it better. And even so, I think it holds up as its do, own. Do you have, in the trilogy, do you have a favorite book? Oh, do you know, my favorite book, I feel like, is always the book I just finished. Yeah. Writing. Um, but having been done with Stormbreak now for, for like, uh, I don't know how long I've been done. With <laughs> what is time? Time is meaningless. Um, I, there are, there are some moments in Stormbreak that I think are some of the coolest scenes I've ever written. Really? I can't wait. Because every time I got to the revision of those scenes, I was so excited. Yeah. Um, so I know that I was speaking to myself. And, and because I started off writing those books um, as a way to find joy and also as a way to gift something to the young reader that I was, that is yeah. really important to me. So there are still some of those scenes that I'm that I'm reading or revising and I'm like, this is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. And it's not long now. It's not long now. But I think uh, all things being equal, I think Steel Tide is going to ultimately be my favorite. Really? Um, it was so hard to write. And it was one that I went back in. And I think I had to, I think I scrapped, oh, probably 40,000 words mm -hmm. of it. Um, in it kind of late in the process, I had this like revelation. Yeah. Um, and you know, it happened during a really trying time in my family's life. So it was, it was this disjointed and strange process that sort of wove in and out of pieces of grief and, um, good things to grief and joy. And, um, I was always a little bit afraid of, writing a bridge book mm -hmm. you know that's the that's the trick of the trilogy is making book two feel like it has earned its space and so that yeah. was what I really wanted to do I wanted the book to feel like it was it was you know the empire strikes back it was the thing that held its own and create and like you can't have book one or book two without it yeah um and I just 
feel like I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that can be, as you said, the bridge book or the second book in a trilogy, for those who don't know what, what we mean when we say bridge book, it has to pull such double weight because you want it to be a strong story on its own while also being this kind of momentum, this ramp up. But I have to know, because I feel like for as long as we've known each other, I don't know the answer to what I'm about to ask. I want to know more about your process because that's really what so much of this weird little chat show is about this idea that there's no right way. And, you know, I've had people on who write linearly people on who don't plan at all. And so, you know, I know that as writers, we tend to cringe away from the question, like, where do you get your ideas? But twofold question, like, what were the ingredients in the meal that became this trilogy? Like, what were the first ingredients that spoke to you that like kind of became the launch pad? And what did you do with them then? Oh, this is such a big question, Victoria. I know. <laughs> I know. I like making it hard for you and easy for me. That's why I do this. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. How am I going to attack your question? So let's talk process because yeah. I do feel like process is an evolving thing. I mean, just as I'm a different writer yeah. from book to book, I think that how I write changes a little bit from book to book interesting I have to talk yeah I am such oh gosh I cannot even start down a path until I have somebody's ear mm -hmm. and this is really hard for my wife <laughs> who is not a talker and um I you know <laughs> part of the thing that works now is I can approach her at one you know at some point in the day and be like I need to talk <laughs> And I, and I need to talk about this idea that I'm working yeah. through, you know, this, this snarl in the story or this new thing that I think I want to layer in or this yeah. emotional beat. And it used to be when I was, when I was a younger writer, I would just start talking to her. Yeah. <laughs> now you have to warn her. Right. Now I'm like, can you put it on your calendar? And so, you know, I get an hour in the yeah. day or I get 30 minutes or something and we can go outside and we can talk. So I, I have acknowledged this about myself. I need an active listener. Mm -hmm. Is it for your me. own enthusiasm or is it just to help you figure things out? I, it's kind of both because, and it's not necessarily that I need somebody else to like fawn over my ideas. Cause yeah. when I'm talking, they're not really very formed. It's like, I have an idea. <laughs> you just need to verbalize. Our magic. Yeah. And yeah. I just don't need someone to be like, oh my gosh, no one has ever done magic flowers before. You're amazing. I can't, yeah. you know, I, I need to just like start. So yeah. So I think that for me, it's like, am I excited about mm -hmm. this? Once I start talking about it, where does my brain go? Yeah. Um, and is there something there? Like, is there something chewy there? Or um, is there a, like something there that I'm actually interested in exploring. Yeah. So talking is important. I do that. Um, I do that when, um, when I'm worried, I'm not excited about an idea. If I start talking about it, then I get all of a sudden, like the lights come on in my house. Yes. Yes. That's, that's it. It's like, yeah, I, I can't free write necessarily. I can free write, but, but at this stage, it's more about turning on the lights. Yeah. In the house. I love that metaphor. Um, more and more, I'm trying to be a little bit more structured. In mm -hmm. So I've always, I've always liked the nine box setup. Um, I'm not like married to it. Or is anything. that a save the cat setup or what is it? I don't do the structure no, those boxes. I think that it, it would map on to save the cat. It's essentially a three X structure. Can you see this? It's fake. Oh, you have it. Okay. Yeah. Look at you. That is actual so structure. That's, that's structure. And, but the thing is like, I do that and then it, it changes. Yeah. I mean, so the, the three X structure breaks down into, you know, various pieces in each box. And that's like an early sort of brainstorming phase for me. And from there, I, I'm starting to, <laughs> heaven help me. I'm starting to outline. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Come to the dark side. Come like, to the outlining place. I will drag all of you here. I am dragging Danielle. I will drag Zoraida. I will drag yeah. everybody to the outlining place. Yeah, I will help you drag them. Um, <laughs> I'm a I mean, I just I'm, I'm to the point of doing like a beat by beat, like mm -hmm. a chapter by chapter. What is the important emotional beat in this chapter? What is the plot beat in this chapter? And, and some of that feels inorganic, but like 
the writing is where the organic piece comes in for exactly. me. Exactly. I never feel married to that mm -hmm. outline um, because, of course, there needs to be room for discovery. Of course. I but... always compare it to, like, I think when people think that we talk about outlining, they think that we're carving the road that we're going to walk when we're really carving the road map just to make sure yeah. that we don't like wander too far in the wrong direction. And then the discovery comes from actually walking the roads and choosing the paths. It's just having like a lay of the land. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it does, I know some people, for some people, it sort of saps a little bit of the excitement and joy, yeah. but it definitely doesn't for me. I find me it very helpful um, to have that. And then in the revision process, I go back and I do a reverse, mm -hmm. uh, reverse engineered outline. So as I'm reading through, um, I do update that chapter yeah. by chapter so that then I can look at like, okay, here's what I actually did versus what I intended to do. Did I miss uh -huh. things? Or um, is there something here now that needs to be woven in? And yeah, I just yeah. find it, I find it very useful. <laughs> do you have a favorite part of the process? <laughs> No, I used to, I used to feel like, um, revision was my favorite. Yeah. But more and more, my favorite is, <laughs> depending on the kind of day yeah. I'm having, my favorite is whatever I'm not doing. See, exactly. Exactly. My favorite uh, is before I start and after I finish. Yeah. 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 Like, final pass, final pass when it reads like a book. Uh-huh. And you're like, who wrote that? I didn't write that. The hardest thing is when you're doing final pass on one project and you're like in the initial phases oh. of another and you're like, who the wrote worst. this one? The worst. <laughs> well, because you're comparing like a fully formed, fully polished crystal to a, yeah. a pebble that you found on the ground. And you're yeah. like, how in God's green earth am I supposed to turn one into the other? And the answer yeah. is through probably like six to seven rounds of a year's worth of work. Exactly. Oh gosh. I'm on this. I just re so I have a project, um, my, my debut middle grade, which, which is, I'm so coming, excited about. Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> it's coming out next year, but I just yeah. read it for the first time in a year. And with, with like editorial notes. Um, and I was, I, you know, I think a year in some ways is sort of too long mm -hmm. because it is absolutely true now that I am a much different writer and I have, mm -hmm. I have more in my toolbox. So I was reading through it and I had this realization probably within like two chapters where I was like, this is a complete rewrite. There is no oh other way. God. There's no other way for this one to move forward and it's middle grade. So it's yeah. not like it's a hundred thousand words, but, um, but still that's too long because now you have changed as a person and now you have to rewrite it to fit the person that you are now. Also, this was the kind of realization that came with a deep excitement. Okay, so it was a good realization. It was a good realization because it was like, oh, this was my first attempt at a middle grade. Yeah. Um, I spent, you know, several years reading and studying and sort of evaluating, trying to figure out what was middle grade and what yeah. did I, what kind of part of the conversation did I want to join into? Um, and so I did that with this draft and I'm very proud of it. I love that. I love that. But I also am so proud of you for having the strength of character, not to say like, oh, I'm not going to do the work, but to say like, I still can do the work. Because once the book is a book, we, we, as we say, it becomes a static property. But like, to come back to something during revisions and realize, and like, I've had to do that, but it's never really been voluntary. Like, it's never been like, this doesn't fit me anymore. It was more like with Vengeful, it was like, oh, this isn't the book you need to write. Mm -hmm. And that was such, because it wasn't like my choice, it was my choice, but it wasn't, I had to have the doors on that house flung open for me. And I was, I was uncomfortable with the realization that I was so, in the wrong place. One of my big memories of you is when you were finishing Vicious and we were in that house with oh. no internet. Do you remember this? Yes. And you, you at some point were just like crammed into the corner of a room, like between the bed and the wall. Yeah. Uh, yes. just yeah. sort of silently like with your computer <laughs> and I, I remember when you emerged because you were like 
you were transformed. Yeah. You were like, I did it. <laughs> I had picked like a little book nook area, like a tiny little crev crevice that yeah. I had like tucked myself into. Yeah, I, those books take years off my life. Like not only do they take years to write, but they just literally take years off my life. I, also, I think all I, books do now. I think all books do for sure. Um, I just remember coming into your room or wherever you were, and it was sort of this like feral darkness. <laughs> that and sounds I, it does. And I had, um, we had killed a bottle of, of Nutella. Yeah. And yes. there was just like the dregs in it. And I was like, no, we can't throw this way. Victoria needs this. I did. I, did. I brought it to you with a spatula. Do you remember? Oh, I remember. I remember you this it out. vividly. Vividly. You know what? Like I go a little feral towards the end of a book. But it's weird because like other people speed up and they go into this kind of like manic process. I start becoming yeah. intensely afraid I'm going to drop it all. And like, it's interesting because yeah. my process has now changed over the last three or four years to the point where the only way for me to get out of my own fears of inadequacy is to have such an outline beforehand that I have just immense confidence in the story. So now I, I like, don't start writing unless I'm like, yeah, it's a baller, baller book. That, that is making more and more sense to me. And it's definitely not how I started off. No, I started no. off with like, okay, I know the beginning point. I know the yeah. end point. Same. I know a few things that are going to happen. I know. Let's go. I know. The process has ruined me. I mean, like the book I'm writing now is my 21st. And um, I like could not start writing the book until I was so confident that the plot was strong enough. Because all I could think is like, this is going to be the book that comes after Abby LaRue. Like, I have a middle grade in there, but, like, my next, like, yeah. larger book. And I was like, oh, wow, just no pressure. And I just put all this pressure on myself these days. So I don't know. Like, I, whatever you have to do to get through and the understanding that, like, even when we find a process, it is a process for that book and for that time and for who we are in that moment. Yeah. It's you would true. think we'd learn how to do it and then be able to do it again and again and again. But no. No, I'm in a place right now where I have let go of that feeling yeah. of why can't I learn how to do this? <laughs> I have never let because go of it. I I can't, if I hold on to it, it, it starts to just like needle away at my confidence. And I have to just remember that every process is new. Every project is new. So I need to give myself the space to learn how to do that project. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot of grace, which I think is so important. And is that, did you feel like that was a grace that you came to just like organically or like, how do you come to that permissions with yourself? I, I think I have to work very hard to, um, to sculpt what pressure I choose to like, let stay in my life because I am very goal oriented. I think that you and I have a lot of similarities and we've discussed this. Um, yeah. Like I'm an achiever. And so I need it every day. I start mm -hmm. the day. I have in my mind, here are the five things that I need to achieve to feel like I, I, there's that gold star. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> the Whatever validity it system. It's the, your, your worth yes. is tied to your work system. Yes. And, um, so I, in the past couple of years have worked really hard to make sure that I am choosing those items mm -hmm. and, um, when they are sort of the larger, like, Sagittarian goals of I'm going to take a shovel into my backyard and dig a hole so I can yeah. install a pool myself. Uh, that's not going to happen. It's probably <laughs> like, not the right energy or not the right use for the energy that you have. Yes. It's a self-defeating kind of, of idea and a goal. So I really have been working on breaking those bigger goals into the smaller pieces that um, I can achieve. And, and whether it's in a day or if it's in a week or a month or a year, that's what I have to do. But, mm -hmm. you know, if I start the day and I, my goal is like, okay, today I, in my exercise, I'm going to do five miles. And I know yeah. my typical exercise is like three and a half. And if I then don't reach the five, even if I did three and a half, yeah. the day is, the day is going to be a bad one because I yeah. didn't make, make that goal, even though it's like, but look at what you did. Exactly. I'm trying to learn to promise less, deliver more for myself. Yes. Because for a long time, like I would write for the last decade, I have written to-do lists, which are undoable. Like every day, my to-do list is patently undoable in that if I feel like it's too doable, I will add things to it 
to make it undoable. Like it's it's not a realistic Victoria. To do this. I know. I'll add things to it that are just like finish this book and then read this book and then write this and then and I had to realize like I was just be no matter how much I accomplished in a day, feeling so disheartened with myself every day, you know? So I think that idea of of taking it down to bite size for achievers can be super important. And then like exceed expectations. Exactly. And you can give yourself that gravy goal. Yeah. That goal of like, and if I do this, well, yeah. then I'm an extra I do love a gravy person. goal. I do love a gravy goal. I need to actually, my problem is I don't know about you as an achiever. I'm real shit at like actually giving myself rewards because yes. there's no celebration for like victory. You just move on. The reward is that you did it. I know, but I like, I like can't give myself a cookie. Like I, I don't know how to give myself a cookie for anything. This is real for me too. Yeah. I, I totally, totally understand. And I have no yeah. good advice. My reward is the absence of self-loathing. <laughs> it's like a really terrible <laughs> reward to have, but it's true. Um, okay, but this show this is not is my, my neuroses. I, um, <laughs> I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about the role of community. Because like, in addition to writing books, you are also such, I feel like, a pillar of the middle grade and YA community. You... You help create madcap retreats, like you work with the community to help empower upcoming writers. And I want to know where does that, where does that come from? Mm. That, that feels like a bigger question than I can answer. I don't really know where it comes from. I, I guess, I mean, I grew up, my mother was very community focused, mm -hmm. so maybe it's just like modeling. Um, but I, I feel like for publishing in particular, that retreat that I went on as an yeah. unagented, <laughs> very young, aspiring author um, was really transformative for me because it put me in a room with women who were all my peers and um, we were all discussing the business as if it was a business. So everybody yeah. was taking each other seriously. And that was just like a, the lights came on in the house and, um, you know, nobody gave me, uh, nobody handed me to their agent and said, <laughs> we liked her, yeah. you know, find her. I still went through the slush pile, but the, the kind of conversation that I was able to have at that retreat was so deeply important. I yeah. learned so much. I constantly refer back to it and say that it um, closed huge gaps for me um, with, with how I viewed the publishing industry. I think that a lot of that is accomplished online now. Yeah. But at that point in time, it really felt to me like there was something that I could help do for others, which was yeah. close those gaps. Um, and I mean, that's basically all that went into my thinking for developing madcap retreats and mm -hmm. putting together these events for aspiring authors and existing or, or experienced authors um, and workshops as well. Yeah. So I really They're just like wonderful. closing gaps. But um, I think also it's that like, so I, ha I was just as impacted by the retreat that you and I both went on way back in the day, but I... I came out of it with like, I was just as formative, but in a super different way. And I think this is a reflector on how I'm not a community builder. I'm like a tiny little island, but I was shocked because that retreat was the first time I saw people talking openly and honestly about publishing. Yeah. And what at the time, this was back in 2010, 2011, what it, what it brought to the fore for me was the lack of transparency in those online spaces. And also just like, I felt so much less lonely at that retreat. Yeah. And for me, it was a changer in that it changed how I, how I used my online presence and the transparency that I brought to that. But I also think like, it's such a gift to have spaces where you can talk openly and honestly about the business without judgment, without hierarchy, because I feel like so often that click mentality or that hierarchy mentality or who's worth your time to talk to about X, whereas like, Really, I speak a lot of times about the generations of publishing, but like we have generational imperatives to like help make sure that the kids, so to speak, the ones who are the up and coming authors don't have to fumble through the dark in some yeah. of the ways that we did. And I think that your retreats are such a gift in that way, not only from a craft perspective in which they are extraordinary craft educations, but in terms of community building and really showing you, I think we get such a narrow slice of, 
of other writers online. And it's a very curated slice. And I feel like those retreats are a much more holistic experience of each other as people. Thank you. That's exactly what I want them to be. <laughs> yeah. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. Look, we're, we're, we're running forward in time. And so we have to talk about the anthology, which oh, is yeah. coming out. Um, I got to know, like, you have Vampires Never Get Old, which I am part of. You and Zoraida are responsible for it. So I have to know, the vampires, is this a long-standing love? And where did the anthology come from? So I don't think that I have had a long-standing love with vampires. I I am a fan, I suppose, yeah. of vampires in general. But I grew up, this is going to age or date me for everyone, but I grew up with Buffy. Uh, so Buffy, did I. If it's but dating she was, you, it's dating me. She was my age. So Okay, Buffy I was only up. not that, yeah, okay, we're still, it's the same. <laughs> we were both sophomores in high school. And I think that, like, I really super identify with that kind of character. Yeah. Um, I am such a Sagittarius. Like I am ridiculous when it comes to acting before I think through something. Yeah. Um, and uh, like digging a had, swimming pool in the backyard. Like digging a swimming pool in the <laughs> backyard. Um, I've had several ridiculous sort of like brushes with death. Yeah. It just those, those little fun things. Sagittarian brushes with death. That's fine. Um, so I think for me, I just really appreciate vampire lore, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and Zoraida is much more like, she grew up as like the goth chick, right? Yeah. So, um, we were on a retreat as, as we've discussed, we do kind of frequently. And, um, it was, I don't know, it, it was too cold to be in the pool, but we were in the pool anyway. And Zoraida just started talking about how she missed vampires. And I was mm -hmm. like, I miss them too. But you know what we actually want is the evolution of vampire. We yes. don't need to see the same vampire that we've seen. Um, we have plenty of great examples of the cishet white brooding vampire. Yeah. <laughs> what we need is to get together a group of authors who are going to give us something different. And so we just started making a list right then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we got everyone. <laughs> it was, I have to tell you, one of the most fun experiences I've ever had. And like, just having the freedom to be like, I'm going to write the vampires that I really could have used as a teenage queer girl who didn't understand queer identity at all. Like, I basically, I just, it was so freeing because vampires are something that I love. Um, I, I love all of the themes around the lore. I love the potential for them, but also... I was thinking the other day about the absence of mirrors and how like I was asked recently in an interview how how old I was when I saw myself like in media and uh I was like 31 like I was like 31 when I saw someone who didn't just <laughs> represent like a piece of my identity but whom I felt actually related to because I feel like we grew up with so many crumbs but also like in the queer community, you're given a tangential piece and you're told like, well, is this good enough? And then if it doesn't really line up with your experience, you feel even more lost because you're told there's like binaries within binaries within binaries, you know, you're right. told like queer or gay looks like this or gay looks like that. And to just have the freedom to try and create a mythology or a lore for the teenager that I could have been um, was so much fun. Every story in this anthology makes me so happy. Like, it's just oh my gosh. so wonderful. It, it's a collection of gems, and I know that I'm biased, but <laughs> it, is, it is a good anthology. It's so good. I mean, the, so good. The, the ways that everybody engaged with vampire mythology and sort of teased out something different. Yeah. I, there, were, there were times when Zoraida and I were just like, we got what we wanted. How did we get what we wanted? <laughs> <laughs> it's so exciting. And so wait, it comes out September, is it 15th or 22nd? 22nd. 22nd. Vampires Never Get Old, out September 22nd. Stormbreak, right? Yes. Stormbreak out November 10th. Correct. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> uh, both of them available for pre-order. And this brings me to the hardest question. The question oh, that no. I end all of my interviews on, which is this idea that we create and we create and we create, but we never get to choose how we're received, right? We'll never get to choose which of our stories gets published and which don't, which of our stories finds its readership 
and which doesn't. Uh, we'll never get to, to, to dictate anything but the content that we create, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. you'll never get to get to have control over which story outlives you. But the question is, if you had to choose, if you could choose, um, obviously you've got the two series right now and you're allowed technically to say something that hasn't come out yet, but if you could only choose one of your works to outlive you, if you could walk into a bookstore a hundred years from now and there was one book with your name on it still there, what would it be? Oh, Victoria. I know. I love it. I like making life hard for people. Um, I mean, of course, I, I, I do hope that I haven't written it yet because mm -hmm. there are things that I w that I'm so excited to delve into in the future. I have a couple of projects rolling right now that I just, I vibrate, I get yeah. so excited and, and I have learned so much about myself uh, and who I am as a writer uh, through these. So you're not going to, yeah. Ah, uh, Victoria. I, okay, I, okay, okay. Okay. No, 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 no. I have an answer. I have okay. an answer. I do. Even though I am about to rewrite, I, of all the books that I know are going to be published right now, yeah. um, I hope The Devouring Wolf, my, my debut middle grade, is one that stays on the shelf because it is one where I'm delving into werewolf mythology um, from a, a queer starting point. Yeah. And it is a community of werewolves where kids all are supposed to transform between the ages of nine and 12. And what happens when you don't? Yeah. When the expectation about your body is not what actually happens. Um, I feel like, I just feel like it is the kind of story that I hope kids can find for decades and generations. I am so desperately excited for this book. Do we have a release date yet? No, I, I think Decent. it's going to be fall okay. 2021. So we have a little ways to wait. We have yes. a little ways to wait. But luckily for people listening in the meantime, if they haven't started um, your trilogy, they can start it. If they have started it, they can finish it. They can pick yes. up Beware the Wild. They can pick up any one of your works. Um, Natalie, you are just such an absolute delight. Oh, Victoria, same. I miss you so I much. I miss you too. But we are so lucky and fortunate to have this community and to be able to reach across time and space from the future over here in France to you in Kansas, right? Kansas. Kansas. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you everyone for watching or listening. This will live on IGTV, but it will also be uploaded over to YouTube. So it will be immortalized. Every piece of this will be immortalized. The hair in the mouth and the giant Manhattan all of it. Oh my gosh, all of it. Victoria, thank you so much for hosting these every week. You've been doing such good work for this community and we are all so appreciative of you. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to stay connected. I miss everybody and I never thought I'd say that because I'm a like introverted cancer, but yeah. like here we are. Here we are. Who knew? Here we are. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I hope everyone else does too. Um, just have a great time. You too. Right on. <laughs> Bye.